oftentimes you say to yourself, geez, I could do this better. And, you know, <laughs> maybe it's not the worst I've, thing I've to, to have someone <laughs> say, you know, F it. I'm going in there and I am going to do this better. And if that, at the end of the day, makes the state a better place, you know, there are different ways to to affect the state positively. But the, but, but the next step, of course, is one of being an affirming partner in, in this approach. And let me point out an example. Uh Ms. Raimondi, in, in her previous tenure as treasurer, spent a great deal of time um, avoiding the harsh spotlight of the media in terms of just pure job performance. And, you know, the, there's questions about the type of funds she invested in, her relationship with the people, the fees involved, on and oh, on. Oh, I think on. the media was on her, I mean, even on a national level. Well, I no, just no, want to no, know no, how no, no, low is. I, I, I get that. I get that. She that the media was on her. Yeah. But... They weren't overly successful, and now we've moved on to another administration, as I like to call him progressive darling Seth Magaziner, mm -hmm. is employing a lot of those same approaches despite his campaign, what limited campaign he did have, all right, being talking all about what the T word, you know, the most overused word of, of 2014, transparency. Mm -hmm. um, so now there seems to be a lot less outrage because there's a lot less media covering it and those media types are increasingly seeing i believe working for these very people that they cover as an employment future i i just hmm. I, I i see no outrage uh, i don't think the majority of journalists i can't speak for the majority of journalists i can only speak for myself sure you can that's what we do on this I, show i don't <laughs> think the majority of journalists are consciously or even unconsciously going softer because they think they're taking jabs at what may be their future boss. I hear what you're saying, and there have been too many former journalists to go into government work to not think about that, but I don't think that's a factor. I mean, if anything, it's a bigger factor that uh, the news organizations aren't sturdy financially enough that that's a factor. Um, that they can't be the same, you know, force, uh, fearless force that they once were for fear of litigation or losing advertisers. I'd say that's probably more of a softening uh, effect than personal journal uh, journalists saying, hey, I might go work for Joe Treasurer or Joe Governor or Jane Governor or Mayor, that I'm going to ease up on this one. I'm not sure that happens. We, we worry that the pursuit of access has been diminished because of a fear of losing access. Well, that was a conversation that the whole access, access. thing that happened with um, Michael Hastings and uh, mm -hmm. General McChrystal when that whole thing happened. You know, he was embedded with this general who, you know, with a reporter around, got liquored up and said all these things and was eventually fired for insubordination. And there was this interesting conversation. He was a kind of a one-off reporter who just flew in for this one story, whereas the people who were on the General McChrystal beat would have never done that because they would have been risking their access. It turned into a really interesting conversation. Um, you know, I, of course, sided with Hastings because you never want to feel like the, the information you're getting is softer or sanded down because the reporter wanted to maintain their relationship. But I've never been assigned to a specific beat like that. So I've never, thankfully, had to really worry about that. This is going to help me. So I, wait. Can I? I just yeah. want to. We only have a few minutes left here on the show, and I definitely want to get into uh, your your FOIA fiasco yeah. that that's right. going on right well, now. I, and that that's what I that's what I want to lead into with this question. Sure. Is 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 in sense, despite eight years or six or seven years at this point of a allegedly po liberal progressive administration, mm -hmm. is access from the media even more suspect than ever? Has it become so clouded? And tell me about Dr. Volkman. <laughs> okay, I'll just start to answer the first part of your question. Um, people on all sides of the aisle, left, middle, right, in the media, I think are in agreement that the Obama administration has been historically non-transparent, despite things like he, the fact that he wrote a memo on the first day encouraging department heads to approach FOIA with a sense of transparency and openness, and he wanted to be the most transparent administration ever, that's clearly proven not to be the case from, you know, the kind of intimidation of James Risen of the New York Times mm -hmm. to, I think, there was spying on the AP right. to various, I mean, I'm most familiar with the DEA, uh, and I often quote one article from Reason.com that 
Uh, DEA FOIA rejections are up 114% since the Bush administration. That was an article in 2012. Um, Speaking of the DEA, so (laughs) I'm going to be super quick here because it's literally a whole book that's living inside my head that I can't just fully describe in a few minutes. But a long story short, uh, a guy that my dad went to college and medical school with is currently serving four consecutive life terms in federal prison in southern Indiana for Uh, numerous convictions on counts of prescription drug dealing, which prosecutors said led to the overdose deaths of a number of his patients. I learned about this case, which was kind of a whoa moment, uh, to learn that this guy with an MD, PhD from the University of Chicago was being charged with such enormous crimes. Uh, Also, this guy who had such close proximity to my dad. I have their yearbook photos from the University of Rochester and the University of Chicago. And in a weird sense, they kind of look like, you know, brothers who took opposite paths. Um, but I became interested in this in around 2009 when I learned about it. I reached out to Dr. Volkman, who at that time was post-indictment, pre-trial. Uh, he was living in Chicago, and I basically said, hey, I'm a graduate student. Uh, I heard about your case. I'd be interested to write about it. And in order to write about it, I'd like to interview you. And I got a call a few weeks later, and so began this really bizarre odyssey uh that started with an interview with him this essentially accused of serial um murder is too strong a word but he was accused of serial manslaughter yeah well that wasn't technically but he was charged with but in essence he was charged with causing the deaths of more than 10 of his patients via improper prescriptions that these people took as directed and then died um so i fell down a rabbit hole in the sense of Uh, the world of chronic pain management and opiates and addiction, which is a hugely complex subject. Uh, I fell down the rabbit hole of exploring this guy's life, how he got from point A, this MD, PhD with a specialty in toxicology to, you know, a federal prison cell in Terre Haute, Indiana. And I also spent a lot of time in southern Ohio in a town called Portsmouth, right on the Kentucky border on the Ohio River, a kind of burnt out former industrial town uh, where Dr. Volkman had been practicing medicine or dealing drugs as it happened uh and this town had its own really intense uh history of overdoses and addiction and what were called pill mills these pain clinics that dispensed a lot of medication that people said were just doing it to kind of churn out uh money so uh after volkman's trial ended in 2011 and was an eight-week trial in federal court I had attended some of it. I actually got booted out of the trial when I was issued a subpoena by one of the prosecutors, which is a whole other story. Uh, I was never called to testify, but if you're given a subpoena, you are removed from the courtroom because of separation of witnesses. Um, And uh, after the trial, really simple request. I just wanted to see the evidence that the jury had seen. The list of exhibits is 16 pages long. I asked a number of people for it, from the clerks to the judge to the prosecutor. Everyone said no. So uh, I filed a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information request, with the Department of Justice on February 1st, 2012, and more than three years ago. And bottom line, it still hasn't been fully completed after more than three years. And you've had uh, you've had support from both the our senators, our congressmen. You've had a, a pretty wide range of support most recently. Support might be overstating it. Yes, they sent inquiries on my behalf in a perfect world. They could have done more. I understand why they didn't. But the letters were just letters, and they got responded to with letters back from the DEA. Um, I think it helped for the DEA to know that they had three national representatives. <laughs> it certainly helped the the local Pauls that <laughs> sent those letters. To, you know, that's an image thing. Oh, I'm all for yeah, free speech um, and, and transparency. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't get me wrong. I'm grateful, but I'm not sure because here we are three years later, at, not three years after the complaints, but three years after the request, it's still not fulfilled. And it was a very simple request. It, and, and it seems like, hey, this this trial has happened. This guy has been sentenced. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the gavel has dropped, literally. Yeah. Uh, so let's just get this all out in the open. That's um, what I'm so saying. of uh, get like quick percentage, like ballpark percentage, would you say how, how much of your request has actually been fulfilled right now as far as documents and also as far as uh, how those documents were redacted? Are we out of time? 
We're just about out of time. What, what would you say? How would you answer that? Well, I mean, they say they've processed eighty-five percent, but they've withheld over ninety percent or over eighty-five percent of what they've processed. So right now, effectively, I would say I have about five percent of the trial evidence in hand. Where can we find more information about Phil Al and and this case? And we hope you'll take advantage of the coalition as one of a number of forms. Absolutely. You Thank you for having me. At Phil Isle on Twitter, uh, Facebook.com backslash Phil Isle Writer. That's basically where I'm constantly broadcasting the latest of what I'm up to. Great. You've been listening to The Coalition on AM790. Uh, Phil, thanks again for coming in. We want to have you in soon. We talked about having a media panel. Again, Facebook.com slash The Coalition Radio. You will find this podcast within the next day or so, amongst others, at coalitionradio.us. Uh, again, Dave, quickly, what do we have lined up for next week? What do we have lined up for next week? You'll find out soon on our <laughs> blog. Thanks again for listening, and have a great week. <laughs>